stronger than any dragon of Tarkir, more menacing than Ashiok, and more eager to take a life than Massacre Girl, Frank Horgan is the walking, talking embodiment of destruction that would give an Ultrazi Titan a run for their money. Time to die. Hello friends, Courier6 here with the Kaladesh Express, your number one source for universes beyond. And today we're going to be discussing Agent Frank Horgan, the enclave enforcer extraordinaire who is eager to emerge as your executive executioner. Today we're going to be going over the lore of Agent Frank Horgan, and we're going to do a little bit of a deck tech. I'm going to show you guys how I would build him and how I would build him most accurate to his lore. That being said, there's time codes in the description and right here in the video in case you want to skip the lore or you've already seen the lore and just need to see the deck tech. Otherwise, come along with me, muties. We're going to be discussing Agent Frank Corrigan and have a great time doing it. Spoiler warning for all of Fallout 2, content warning for bodily harm, blood, and torture. All of them will be censored or pixelated. Frank Horgan was born in 2211. Not too much is known about his childhood, and his story really doesn't begin until his 20s. He used to serve at the Enclave headquarters, known as the Oil Rig, as the personal bodyguard of President Dick Richardson, the leader of the Enclave. He was actually advancing quite quickly up the ladder of the Enclave leadership, until he wasn't very suddenly. But we'll get to that. The Enclave loved him for his sheer power, loyalty, and unhinged behavior as he could be used to get things done for the Enclave that other members might not have the stomach for. It was a lot like Anton Chigurh from No Country from Old Men, but far more unhinged and a lot dumber. But one day, his unhinged behavior went too far and he had to be reassigned to Wasteland Patrol duty as he was deemed too unstable to be around such a high profile and important entity like the President. During one of his wasteland operations, he came into contact with the forced evolutionary virus at Mariposa Military Base, the same place where we meet the Master in Fallout 1. This began the process of forcibly mutating him into a super mutant. The Enclave decided to send him back to the oil rig after this for further experimentation. For two long years, Frank Horgan was experimented on by Enclave scientists while he was mutating into a super mutant. Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Charles Curling experimented with his own personal modified strains of FEV on Frank, further mutating him. During these two years of experimentation, he was kept under heavy sedation and only allowed to be conscious for short periods of time, during which several violent incidents occurred. When tests had concluded and Enclave doctors had figured they'd gotten all the data they could out of Frank, higher-ups decided it was time to redeploy him as a field operative. He was fitted with a custom-engineered set of power armor, powered by a back-mounted, super-sized microfusion reactor, his armor now continually injecting him with drugs and other stabilizing agents, and is the only thing keeping him alive. Armed with a hardened composite blade for close combat, and an experimental prototype plasma gun for long range, he is the single deadliest combatant in New California, able to take down other super mutants and death claws with ease. Now viewed as a genetically engineered freak and barely resembling the average super mutant, he was a unique monstrosity to the California wasteland. To ensure his utter loyalty, the Enclave took advantage of his low intelligence and began running various conditioning programs on him, ordered by the president himself. Despite his exposure to the virus and numerous augmentations, Oregon refused to identify as a mutant, preferring to derogatorily label other wastelanders as muties. You've gotten a lot farther than you should have. But then you haven't met Frank Horgan either. Your ride's over, Muty. To the Enclave scientists, he was categorized as an experiment. While among soldiers, he was viewed as an oddity engineered by the scientist team, a monster that few were eager to accompany on field missions. Horgan was frequently dispatched to the wasteland, assigned to address any threats to the Enclave. He took pleasure in his cruel tendencies and his ruthless methods of dispatching mutants. This left a lasting psychological impact on the Enclave soldiers assisting him, haunting their dreams indefinitely. On August 30th, 2241, Horgan was given the assignment to locate and enlist the aid of an elderly farmer whose information was deemed important. When the farmer declined cooperation, Horgan swiftly terminated him, showing no remorse for his actions. The Chosen One, the player character, had the unfortunate experience of witnessing this execution, marking their initial encounter with Frank Horrigan. Surprisingly, Horrigan chose to spare them and departed, a decision that would later prove to be a significant error in the fall of 2242. During that fall, 
the Chosen One would meet Frank Horgan again, one final time, when they invaded the Enclave oil rig and destroyed a key terminal, triggering a meltdown. Horgan then secured the exit to the rig, preventing them from leaving. Me, Frank Horgan. That's who. United States Secret Service. You aren't going anywhere from here. Making our reactor meltdown means that things are going to be pretty hot in here soon. Pity you won't live long enough to see it. You're not a hero. You're just a walking corpse. In the ensuing fight, Horgan would be mortally wounded. Damage to his system was too extensive, and he was bisected at the waist. However, this mortal wound didn't kill him instantly. Horgan managed to lift up his torso and stand on his hands, taunting the Chosen One one last time. You... You haven't won here. You and your mutie bastard friends are gonna join me in a big old mushroom cloud send-off. I just triggered the self-destruct. <laughs> The work will go on. You didn't do nothing here except seal your own death warrants. Duty. <coughs> Honor. Courage. Semper Fi. After reciting the Oath of the Enclave, Frank Horgan collapsed. The internal pressure from his failing power armor in his augmented body blew his head clean off. Frank Horgan is one of the most dangerous characters in all of Fallout. He has the highest health pool in the game, and is equipped with two unique weapons that do devastating amounts of damage. He's also very fast, and if his weapons are disabled, Horgan will throw hands to the death. Additionally, Horgan's armor grants him high resistance to small arms fire, explosions, lasers, and plasma bolts, the weapons the Chosen One most likely has available to them. He is the biggest, baddest dude in the wasteland, and no other organic character in Fallout comes close. Except maybe Joshua Graham. So I've had a lot of time to think about Frank Horgan while making the first half of this video and I've decided the deck I'm going to make for him is going to fall more into his tendency to want to work for other people and protect them. Kind of go out and do the dirty work for you know the higher ups. So with that in mind we're going to make a Frank Horgan Golgari Planeswalker Proliferate kind of deck. I think that is most in line with his character. You know, something that hits hard, but also he just wants to work for other people. He's been brainwashed, so I guess he doesn't want to, but he has to. And that's kind of the vibe I want to go for. So, let's get into the deck tech. Alright, so the first card we're going to be discussing today is Agent Frank Horgan. This is our commander. He's a legendary creature, mutant warrior for 5, a black and a green. He has a power of 8 and a toughness of 6. He has trample and indestructible as long as he's attacked this turn. And whenever Asian Frank Horgan enters the battlefield or attacks, proliferate twice. Like I said at the top, we're going to be focusing on Planeswalkers for this deck, and his ETB and attack triggers of proliferating is going to be really useful to get those Planeswalkers to ult very quick. Also, his large power toughness is going to be able to protect those Planeswalkers pretty well. As far as Planeswalkers are going to be looking to use as our win conditions, we're going to find ones that will either ult as soon as Agent Frank Horgan hits the battlefield or as soon as he attacks. We have six of those, and those are Garuk, Caller of Beasts, Liliana, Waker of the Dead, Ugin, the Spirit Dragon, Varaska, the Unseen, Varaska, Betrayal Sting, and Varaska, Golgari Queen. I picked these six because, like I said earlier, each of these cards will alt either as soon as Frank Horgan enters the battlefield or attacks, and they will basically win the game on the spot. But it wouldn't be much of a super friends deck with just six planeswalkers, so we've got a lot more. And these are going to be the utility planeswalkers, or the ones that don't immediately win when we play them. Those are Garuk, Apex Predator, Garuk, Cursed Huntsman, Garuk, Relentless, Garuk, Unleashed, Liliana Vess, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, Liliana of the Veil, vale, Nissa of the Shadow Bows, Nissa, Vital Force. Nissa, who shakes the world, Tyvar Kell, Vivian Reed, and Varaska, Relic Seeker. We played these ones because we don't really care if they get taken out too much. We'd rather these ones get taken out over our win conditions, and these ones will pretty immediately create us a token when they enter the battlefield, which acts as a blocker, or animate a land, which could act as a blocker, something that can help protect our board and give us presence besides just the planeswalkers. Or they have some amazing utility. Cards like Tyvar Kell, who can help our green elves tap for black and then thus casting more planeswalkers for us, or Liliana of the Veil, who's both a discard outlet and creature removal for our opponents. 
and Vivian Reed, who can help us find more creatures by looking at the top four cards of our library and can destroy target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. Creature with flying is especially useful as those are going to be the biggest threats to our planeswalkers. If the circumstances are right, any of these planeswalkers could also be a win condition for us, but we're looking at them more as a utility piece than a win condition. But with big mana planeswalkers like Faraska, Relic Seeker, Garuk, Apex Predator, and oh my god, Ugin the Spirit Dragon who costs 8 mana, we're going to need a lot of ramp to get these guys onto the battlefield. And a lot of ramp we have with creatures, artifacts, and sorceries. Altogether, we're running 16 dedicated pieces of ramp. Quickly going over that list, we have Birds of Paradise, Elves of Deep Shadow, Elvish Mystic, Finthorn Elves, Llanowar Elves, Sockware Tribe Elder, Tato Farmer, Cultivate, Kadama's Reach, Nissa's Pilgrimage, Rampant Growth, Arcane Signet, Felwar Stone, Golgari Signet, Soul Ring, and Talisman of Resilience. We only have a few non-ramp creatures in the deck, and that's going to be cards like Karth the Lion, who normally leaves the Golgari Super Friends deck, but is still super useful in our 99. His ability to find us new Planeswalkers when old ones die is always going to be useful, and his ability to effectively reduce the cost of Planeswalker abilities is going to allow some to alt even faster than Agent Frank Horgan will. Then we have a much simpler card in Eternal Witness, which I honestly believe that no green deck should be built without. And then we have the cards that just help our Planeswalkers get counters faster. Cards like Evolution Sage, Peer, Imaginative Rascal, and Vorinclex, Monstrous Raider. An unavoidable expense and pretty necessary engine in most Planeswalker decks nowadays. The last creature we run is one I kind of forgot about until recently, and that's Storev, Devkarian Lich. This zombie elf wizard is a pretty good recursion engine for our Planeswalkers so we can use them again. And it also just happens to be an elf, which one of our Planeswalkers allows to tap for mana, which is pretty great. Speaking of recursion pieces, we're on to utility now, and we've got three more cards dedicated to bringing our planeswalkers back to the battlefield. Those are Command the Dreadhorde, Confront the Pass, and Aid the Fallen. We also have Contagion Clasp to help us proliferate on our planeswalkers and maybe incidentally remove a dork or something, and the Chain Veil to help us activate our planeswalkers twice, and coincidentally was just reprinted recently, so it's as cheap as it's ever been. And then we've got three pieces of straight card draw to help us find our planeswalkers. Those are Harmonize, Sign in Blood, and Read the Bones. We have a final piece of card advantage in this deck as well, that being Kamal's Druidic Vow, which can help us find Planeswalkers and put them directly onto the battlefield. It's one of our big game winning spells. The final category we got is Interaction, and to start that off we've got three pieces of single target removal, those being Smell Fear, Beast Within, and Crows and Grip. Then we have a few Fogs, those being Fog, Darkness, and Obscuring Haze. We also run one final protection spell in Heroic Intervention that gives us holistic board protection when we really need it. The final spell we run in the deck is Nevenerol's Disc, and that's just because every deck needs a board wipe and this one at least doesn't hit Planeswalkers. As far as lands go, we run 37, and I'm not going to go over all of them like I say in most videos. Run what you have and upgrade when you can, but there are a couple I want to mention, and that being Nykthos Shrine to Nyx, and Interplanar Beacon. Nykthos will be pretty good in the deck because our devotion to green will be pretty high at most points in the game, and the incidental life game off Interplanar Beacon will be pretty useful, and the color fixing ain't bad either. If you're looking for an exact land breakdown, check the Moxfield link in the description, I'll have the deck down there, and it'll show you exactly my breakdown for all my lands. And that concludes the lore explanation and deck tech for Agent Frank Corgan. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I really enjoy making this kind of thing, I love talking about these super cool characters from a franchise I love. It's one of the most badass characters in all of Fallout, and being able to make a deck about him or for him, it's been really cool. I do think, all things considered, Agent Frank Corrigan works better in the 99 of Karth the Lion, but I really wanted to make a deck that was more about him, so I had to cut a lot of the Karth stuff when I was looking at lists and designing this deck and kind of focus it more into what Frank is good at. And that's being a meat shield and attacking and, you know, just dealing damage. So that was the focus for this deck tech when I was building this versus a Karth the Lion kind of Golgari Super Friends deck. But I really enjoyed building this. I hope you enjoyed watching. And I hope you enjoyed learning about Agent Frank Morgan. I will be making the Craig Boone video hopefully by the end of next week. And the other two commanders which I mentioned, I believe it was Sean and ah, Marcus. Marcus, I'll be building both of those as well. 
as time permits, but I want to focus on these two first because they are my favorite characters available in the Fallout set. With the possible exception of the Master, and I do actually already have a Master deck, but I felt like that would be kind of, I, I feel like a lot of people are going to build the Master, so I want to show off some decks that maybe people weren't going to build. But otherwise, I'm Courier 6 of the Kaladesh Express, your number one source for universes beyond, and I'll see you soon. Muties, you didn't do nothing here.